here we are in the lab once again. Now today, what I want to do is talk about the concept of angular momentum and the conservation of angular momentum. So what is angular momentum? Well, it's essentially the same thing as translational momentum, except it has to do with the rotation of a body. And actually it's the body's resistance to a change in motion due not only to mass, but also the body's velocity or rotational velocity. Now conservational momentum means that the momentum of the system will remain constant as long as the system is not acted upon by external forces or torques. What this means is, if one parameter changes, the system will automatically adjust and maintain a constant angular momentum. Now here's the apparatus I'll be using. It's essentially a golf ball. I drilled a hole in it and put an eye screw in, so I can attach it to a string. And the string goes over to a tube, which is an empty pen casing, and I got attached to a wooden mast. Now, at the other end of the string, I have a little handle here, so I can actually pull the string and adjust the radius of the ball as it spins. So I'll give you an idea of what that looks like. Then I get started here, and then simply pull the handle. I can change the radius, and we can see the dynamic changes to the ball as it spins. Now, what this does is it allows me to change that radius without introducing any external torques or forces. So we can actually test the concept of conservation of angular momentum. All right, so here's a simple graphic showing the system once again. And the blue circle represents the golf ball and the black represents the string. Now I'm gonna start off with the initial radius of R1, which is 0 0.5 meters for this experiment. Now what I'm gonna do is pull on a string and shorten the radius to R2, which is 0 0.25 meters. Now, let's look at the units we'll be working with. First of all, we'll have tangential velocity, V sub T, is going to be in meters per second. Mass M is going to be in kilograms. Radius R is going to be in meters. Rotational velocity, small omega, is going to be in radians per second. And rotational inertia, I, is going to be in kilograms meters squared. Now, let's take a look at the equations for angular momentum. Angular momentum is denoted as L. L can be rotational inertia times angular rate, I omega, or it can be calculated by mass times tangential velocity times radius, M V T times R, or it can be done using mass times angular rate times radius squared, M omega times R squared. They all result in the same units and the same angular momentum. Now let's do an angular momentum unit check. Let's use L is equal to I omega. The inertia is kilograms meter squared. And omega is going to be radians per second. Now recall that radians are unitless. As so we multiply those two things together, we get units of kilograms meter squared divided by seconds. And that's the units of angular momentum. Now let's take a look at the concept of conservation of angular momentum. For this example, I'm going to use the equation L is equal to I omega. Now, if we were to increase inertia, for example, the ice skater sticks her arms out, the angular rate omega will have to correspondingly drop in order to maintain a constant angular momentum, a constant L. And if the skater pulls her arms in once again, decreasing her rotational inertia, the angular rate omega will have to correspond by speeding up or increasing, again, keeping L constant. Now we can look at conservation of angular momentum from a different perspective. And let's use L1, the angular momentum initially, is equal to L2. And let's use the equations m omega r squared for our angular momentum equation. So I have the left-hand side is L1, and the right-hand side in black is L2. Now since the system uses the same mass, these two masses cancel out, so we can neglect mass in this analysis. I apply some basic algebra, I can come up with a ratio of omega 2 over omega 1 is equal to the ratio of r1 squared divided by r2 squared. So if I know the radius changes, I can actually get a ratio of the two angular rates. Now if we insert the radii for our experiment, I have r1 of 0.5 meters, I square that, and divide that by r2, which is 0 0.25 meters, and square that, I come up with a ratio of 4.0. So we should see an experiment 
as I change the radii from 0.5 meters to 0.25 meters, I should see a corresponding increase of angular rate by a factor of 4. So the theory says if I cut the radius of rotation down to half, I'm going to get a fourfold increase in the rotational velocity. Well, let's do an experiment to see if we can get that result. I analyzed the data using some video editing software I got for free on the internet. Now when I did the analysis, I came to the conclusion that the rotational rate only doubled during that experiment. So the question is, was the theory incorrect? Have I misinterpreted the theory? Or is my experiment flawed in some way? Well, my first assumption is that I've got a flawed experiment. So I want to do a little more testing to see what's going on. Now what I ended up doing was pulling on the string faster reducing the time it took to reduce the radius to see if I could get better results. So let's take a look and see what happened. Now here are the results of that further testing. During test number two, I managed to pull a string and shorten the radii in 0.4 seconds. However, I got an angular rate ratio of only about 2.75 or so. So that was still not uh, acting like the theoretical prediction. So I did test number three and managed to pull a string and shorten the radius in 0.3 seconds. And I got an angular rate ratio of something on the order of 3.25. So I was seeing improvement in the ratio as I pulled the string faster. So I attempted to extrapolate here to see what kind of pull rate I would need in order to be able to get a ratio of 4.0 as predicted by theory. And I would need to pull the string and shorten the radii in 0.1 seconds. So that's a pretty quick pull. So I conducted that test, and let's take a look at the results. Well, as you can see from the data plot, that I reduced the time it took to change from R1 to R2, the results got better. But I wasn't quite there yet. So I figured I'd do one more test and really yank on it hard to try to get that 0.1 second reaction time. Now, unfortunately, when I did that test, the string broke, and my ball went flying off on a tangent off into the lab. So I changed my string to Kevlar to make sure it was strong enough to make sure it could take the loads, and I did that test one more time. So let's go ahead and take a look at the results. So here's the result of test number four plotted on my graph. As you can see, after doing the math, I did come up with an angular rate ratio of 4.0. But come to find out, I only needed to pull the string over a period of 0.2 seconds or so. So I didn't have to pull quite as hard, but it was still a very quick pull, and you actually see the loads and things going on in the video. So I did manage to get the proper ratio, and if I pulled even faster, I think things would stick around at this 4.0 ratio and things wouldn't change. So I've managed to kind of neglect all the, the uh, energy losses and strange things going on. Now let's take a look at the experimental results. By counting frames, I managed to determine for radius R1 equals 0.5 meters that omega 1 was 1.9 revolutions per second. Now counting frames again for radius 2 of 0.25 meters, I came up with omega 2 of 7.7 .7 revolutions per second. Now if I take the ratio of omega 2 over omega 1, 7.7 .7 divided by 1.9, I come up with a ratio of 4.05. That's very close to the theoretical prediction. Now let's compare theory with our experiment. Now the theoretical analysis indicated that omega 2 over omega 1 would be 4.0. And as we just saw from our experiments, our omega 2 over omega 1 experimental is 4.05. So that shows good agreements once we came up with a valid experiment. Now, some of our equations for angular momentum are based on tangential velocity. Now, tangential velocity is a velocity if we accidentally cut the string and how the golf ball would fly off in a straight line. So we calculate tangential velocity by multiplying the angular velocity, omega, times the radius of the swing. So if we put in units, we have omega as radians per second. Again, radians are unitless, times radius, which is meters. So tangential velocity becomes meters per second, so that makes sense. Now, that means we'll have to convert revolutions per second to radians per second, because when I analyzed my video, I looked at one revolution, counted how many frames, determined how fast it was going. So that was in revolutions per second. 
So to convert that to radians per second, I have to multiply by 2 pi radians per revolution. So for omega 1, which was 1.9 revolutions per second, I come up with 11.9 radians per second. And for omega 2, I come up with 48.4 radians per second. Now I can calculate the tangential velocity for both of those. So VT1 comes out to be 5.95 meters per second, and V2 is 12.1 meters per second. So in conclusion, this experiment verifies the concept of conservation of angular momentum. Now, by quickly, and I mean quickly, decreasing rotational radius by a half, the angular rate increased by a factor of four, thus maintaining a constant angular momentum from radius one to radius two. So that's great. This experiment verifies the theoretical analysis. Well, there you have it. We use a very simple experiment to test the concept of conservation of angular momentum. And our results came out pretty good. Now, I hope you got some insight and got a little better understanding of yet another basic physics concept. And I also hope that you learned a little bit about how to get a viable experiment to make sure your results are accurate. Well, I hope to see you next time on Labrat Scientific.